Hi everyone, I'm Mallory Metz and this is Kyle Fredell and today we're so excited to be talking in our ProClinic webinar about AGM and EFB batteries. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Kyle and talk through some housekeeping rules. Sure, we'll start in just a minute as we wait, a few, wait for a few more people to, to join the call. I uh, do want to let you know that we'll be recording this, so if you miss part of it or want to forward it to uh, someone you work with, feel free to do that. And as always, you can attend uh, other IV uh, webinars on demand by going to proclinics at ibsa.com. We have a whole lot of uh, technical training videos there as well as our, our on-demand uh, webinars that we've done in the past. So without further ado, hopefully everybody's on the call now. If not, you're a little bit late. We'll let's kick, go ahead and get this let's started. Let's kick it over to our experts, Jeff Barron and Gail Kimbrough, who between the two of them have almost a hundred years of battery experience. Um, I think if you added us in there, we'd be over a hundred years. So right. they're close. Anyway, they know what they're talking about. I'll come back on later and ask the stupid questions. Mallory's going to cut open a couple batteries with our bandsaw. It's going to be a lot of fun. Have a good time. Take it away, Jeff and Gail. Well, thank you very much. How are you doing, Jeff? I'm doing great, Gail. I am too. It's a great day. It's going to be a great, great day. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, today's agenda. So we're going to talk about the AGM and the EFB batteries. What does that stand for? Absorbed glass mat. Absolutely. What about I, the EFB? What's that stand for? Enhanced flooded, flooded battery. Flooded battery. All right. So we're going to talk about what's inside these batteries. We're going to talk about the AGM and, of course, uh, the build and the qualities there. We're going to talk about the different types and applications. Yes. So we got to make sure we're putting the right battery in that's, there, right? Oh, for sure. That's very important. We're going to talk about the EFB batteries, which, you know, the enhanced flooded battery has got a totally different build than what you'd normally see in a flooded battery or even an AGM. Uh, we're also going to talk about these applications and how it's very vital to make sure that we're putting the right battery into this application. Now, we also really want you guys to be part of this. So we're going to go through Q and A's also at the end. Please, anything that you've got that you're needing uh, answered, help us out because this will be a little bit shorter seminar. So we really want your participation in there because the more questions that you ask and needing the information on, the better off you're going to be whenever we explain all the answers to you. We know that batteries have been around for a long period of time. They started utilizing those forever and ever ago, and the some of the things are still the same. They're still an electrolyte solution, which is water and sulfuric acid, certain percentages of that. There's chemical reaction, releases electrons. We know that there's lead plates in a lead acid battery. We know that that conducts energy in and out. We know that straps create a, a serious connection within the battery, lead post send and receive the power, allow the battery to flow through the, the various components within the vehicle. We know that plates are ins inserted into envelopes. They started that many years ago to reduce the amount of shorts between the negative and positive plates. And we know that there's six compartments or cells within a battery that are approximately 2.14 volts each. Now that cover some of the basics of how batteries have always been built. Oh, we had to get your 69 SS in there. Little didn't we? Hot rod. Well, so Gail, you gotta look. The vehicles have changed since then. Just a little bit. Yeah, so back then, only thing I had that was electric uh, was nothing. Radio. <laughs> well, it's, you know, that was it. Yeah. And that worked off of just cranking up the car and the alternator was taking care of it. Exactly, you could even open the hood of that vehicle and see the valve cover. I could, and that's amazing because nowadays it's hard to even find a valve cover. <laughs> exactly. Oh well, you know, it is what it is. We have evolved, uh, and so what we basically have done is we've put a lot of electrical loads on a vehicle now. I mean, there's no question. Uh, we call these the creature features. You know, back then, uh, you know, I had AC, which that was kind of nice. I didn't have cooled seats which is kind of nice now. I didn't have heated seats back then either. Uh, now I gotta have heated seats. So we have actually increased the electrical demand on our vehicles now that have just, you know, exceeded our imagination to be honest with you. So we've tripled it up and that's, I mean, it started typically about, about 2009 and we just keep adding on. Additions, additions 
tenfold. Exactly. So we look at this and we look about, you know, the demand from the alternator to take care of all this. Uh, well, then we also throw in, hey, guess what? We got EPA that kicked in and said, hey, you know, we want to make these cars fuel efficient. How do we do that? Well, we and turn you know, off loads. Yes. You know, we're that driving. Alternator, that alternator has horsepower is taking away exactly. from our engine. And so efficiency kicks in. Yeah. So we, we take and turn that alternator off while we're driving. Guess what? We, we go from like 20 miles to the gallon to 26 miles to the gallon. But that would have thunk. That puts more strain on our battery. Yes. And that could actually be a potential for warranties if we sure. don't have the right battery in there. Now we look at the vehicles in operation. So since early 2000s, I mean, the flooded lead acid batteries have kind of leveled out a little bit. Uh, as we're looking at 2015 and moving kind of a little bit forward, we're kind of looking at a lot of AGM batteries that are specced in there. Yes. So our vehicles in operations now has kind of changed a little bit on that. But... Then we throw another kink in there, Gail. What is that? We have a situation of vehicles coming out with an EFB. Oh my goodness, we got more now. Yeah, <laughs> so let's talk about the build of an AGM and what makes it work so well. What's the best way to do that? I know, let's cut cutting it open. it open. Yes, sir, so let's roll that beautiful bandsaw, please. Yes. Okay. Hey guys, now we're gonna go ahead and take a look inside an AGM battery. Okay, we have two different types of batteries here today. We have a flooded battery and we have an, have an AGM battery. Now what we've done is we've used the bandsaw and we've cut the tops of these off. Now I want you to notice a couple of things when we take the top off. First of all, you see fluid. You see liquid electrolyte in there, but you also see that there's, from the top of the battery there, there's an inch or so below that for expansion of the liquid electrolyte. Here's an AGM battery, absorbable glass mat. We take, we cut the top off that. Look how the plates are so close to the top. That's the capability of an AGM to have, uh, we don't have to have the liquid, so we have the plates that can come further up, give us more uh, amount of plate surface area, and give us more power availability within that same physical dimension. All right, Jeff, so I know we're looking inside an AGM battery right now, but what exactly do we see? So I'm looking at six individual cells here, all right? So each cell is what we call its own independent power source. So if this were a 700 CCA battery, each cell should produce 700 CCAs. That's why when we're talking about looking at uh, specific gravities, when we're talking flooded batteries, we're looking for a differentiation between sulfuric acid and water within each cell because that's gonna be our total power availability. So on this, we're gonna go ahead and pull one cell out and kind of you know, walk you through the process of what you know, an AGM actually is and how it's designed. Great, let's do it. All right. Oh, nice. Even nicer. Kyle, you don't have to talk about how that's so compressed. Well, this is so compressed in here that trying to get this thing out, as you guys can see, is a chore within itself. Aha. So, if I flip this over, I'm going to be looking at the negative plate. Now, we've always talked about how the negative plates are a different chemistry. Well, you can see this is kind of a gray tint. All right, so this will be our negative plate. Uh, this has been through quite a few cycles. As you can see, it's kind of, uh, I guess it's a little bit brittle, as we would call it. So, it's been through quite a few cycles, but it's still performing very well when we took it out. We're gonna break this tab off here, which is the strap. Let me just kind of go over that. You got a negative strap here and you got a positive strap. So this has got all your positive plates. This has got all your negative plates. So they're kind of stacked. Negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. And in between those, you're gonna see this absorb glass mat that Gail and I were talking about earlier. 
So this will actually wrap around the positive plate, whereas your flooded batteries would actually have a envelope. Well, this is kind of sandwiched with your AGM material. You can see your positive plate is a dark color. So this could be a dark brown, or in this case, it kind of looks black. Uh, it's just because it's been through quite a few cycles. But as you guys saw the compression on these things, it is just unreal how much pressure these things are put in uh, or put together before they get sandwiched into the uh, uh, different cells. So now you've got positive and negative. Once again, your AGM material, and it's gonna be sandwiched throughout this whole thing just like this. So now I'm gonna go back to the negative plate again. And if I were to pull it out, I'm gonna see once again, the AGM material that surrounds this positive. All right, so AGM material, and this is still kind of moist. We could actually get some uh, electrolyte out of that if we squeezed it enough. And I'm sure it'd have a gravity of somewhere in the neighborhood of 1340 or higher on the gravity side of it. So now that you've cut one apart with that, <clears throat> that band oh, saw, yeah. cutting it open, getting to the guts, so to speak. Yes, sir. Now, all, GM, all AGMs are not created equal. We know that. No, sir. There's different types of AGMs. For example, there's pure lead AGMs. Separate that from an alloy AGM because the chemical differences and the resistance differences between those. For example, a pure lead battery has up to three times the cycle life versus a flooded. Faster recharge times, slower self-discharge, better shelf life, extended shelf life. Sealed equals zero water loss. And the MTZ AGM battery is a 99.9% .9 pure lead battery, as we see there. And the alloy AGM. When we talk about alloy, it's been, it's not a pure lead, it's been alloyed with different types of chemicals and metals. And so we have recycled lead plus the alloy, maybe calcium, maybe tin, maybe different things that are added to the battery, lead. And similar, but not as good as a pure lead in a lot of factors. So less expensive than a pure lead because it's recycled lead is brought in. Let's talk about the spiral cell now, Gail. So, yes. So back in the day, and this goes back a few years, Just you know, few. this wonderful battery came out, which was a, a spiral cell. Uh, we called it the six pack design. Yes. So this thing was just a unique animal within itself. All right. The only downside of this thing was, so you had a group size that we worked with and that's, you know, part of the BCI Battery Council International, that's their standards. The issue that we run across with this uh, group size is you're not taking up the full potential footprint. So what happens when you do that? You lose capacity. Yes. So you still had a great battery there and it's a pure lead product, but you're not utilizing that whole footprint of that group size. So unfortunately, your capacities are gonna be lower because it's not utilization on it. But Gail, you wanna talk a little bit about because you know, this, you got to go see the plant back in the day. You know, just like because of my age, I've been around for a long period of time. Uh, and so in that situation, I got to go to the plant and watch the uh, Optima battery be manufactured many years ago when it first came to the United States. And what they do in that is they have a positive plate. They have a continuous positive plate for like 30 something inches. They roll it out and then they put an absorbent glass mat, lay it out, and then they put the negative plate and then they roll that all together to try to fit inside that cylinder. Like a jelly roll? Yeah, kind of like a jelly roll. And so they're trying to fit inside that cylinder. And so they've got a lot of compression there, which makes a difference also yes, in the sir. battery. Vibration a, resistant. Yes, vibration resistant. In fact, this battery was manufactured originally in a military grade type situation, could be used in any upside down, crossway, sideways, so whatever. What you're saying is a plane. Yes. And so you could take that plane upside down and it would still be okay. So it was great in, in a military grade type situation. In fact, you could shoot a bullet hole through the AGM. They, they showed that at one time and it would still function. Wow. But it was different than the flat plate because the flat plate, you have individual cut 
uh, positive plates and negative plates and the AGM material between them. Well, you have the AGM mater material between each of these that are rolled out, but it's rolled in there and has fantastic vibration resistance. So I guess when they were looking at building this thing, instead of having all these sectioned out plates that you were talking about, having one continuous roll, yes, actually, you know, kept the resistance a little bit different. Yes, it's totally different on the resistance factor. When we'd go to test the AGM, because of its resistance factor, it would show different ways or different numbers as far as uh, testing it with a with a uh, the pulse conductance tester, for example, or any conductance tester. A flooded battery would have this resistance and the AGM would have a lot less and especially the Optima. Gotcha. Well, and we also know that there's a difference in the way these things charge. So, you know, AGM versus a flooded there is, is. is a lot of difference. These batteries do not like anything uh, 15 volts or higher. Correct. So 14.8 is typically what you'll see on an AGM charging. That's perfect for the battery because number one, it doesn't dry it out. Right. So if it dries the battery out, you know, for charging too high, we can't have water. No. So now we have a battery that's potentially deteriorating yes. inside at a faster rate. What else do we need to know if you're working with an AGM, Jeff? Well, so we've got to make sure that if we're replacing a battery in a vehicle itself, we've got to make sure that if it's calling for a flooded, and that's what came out original, we've got to make sure we go back to the flooded. But if it calls out AGM, can you go backward? Can you go with a flooded? Probably not, because you're not going to be able to get the charging system to work with that vehicle itself. So we want to make sure we're putting the right battery in the right application. There's profiles, believe it or not, our vehicles now with these computer controlled alternators have profiles in there that are designed around the battery itself to be able to work efficiently with it. So we look at that. We also look at our charging profiles for just bench charging. So if I'm trying to use a, a flooded battery charger on an AGM product on the bench, that battery's not going to like it too well. No, no, because it's got these have got one it's way pressure. Create heat, heat. Yes, inside that battery. So if we create heat, a lot of resistance in there, creating a lot of heat. Yes. We're going to dry it out. Now there are cases where we've seen these batteries kind of balloon out because the pressure relief valves can't keep up with the the pressure coming in. So it can actually balloon the batteries out, and that's never a good thing. Um, if we're also looking at replacing these batteries within a vehicle itself. Nowadays, unfortunately, some of these require a special scan tool to be able to log into the vehicle. And so we call that battery resets or BEM numbers, battery energy management systems, where we've got to be able to program the car stating it's a new battery in there. So you want these batteries compatible with the computer system, the Correct. alternator, the energy system that's around inside that vehicle. Yes. That's very important. Yeah, so if we, if we go in and we install a new battery in this thing and we don't tell the system that it's new, well, guess what? We're going to have a premature failure. So what's happening with these computer-controlled alternators and everything where they're requiring the, the BEM resets or battery registrations, whatever. So we look at that as a, a tool that looks at a battery brand new and it's monitoring it all the way throughout its lifespan. So as the batteries are starting to lose capacity, the alternators now are changing a curve to where it's actually offsetting to take care of that loss in capacity. At the end of life, as we would call it for a battery, uh, and we go to put a new one in there, if we don't tell the system that we just installed a new battery, whether it's an AGM or whether it's a flooded, if we don't go back in there and tell that computer, hey, I just put a new battery in there, guess what it's going to do? You're going to have an overcharge condition. Possibly. Exactly, because it's going to charge exactly like it was doing on that old battery. So. Now your your new battery, uh, you're going to take it out pretty quick. That's yes. never a good thing. You're going thing. to lose life or cycle life in yes, that sir. battery. What do we know? What should we know about the AGM batteries? For example, if you have a battery that comes OE in that vehicle, that OE, that original equipment manufacturer, has already told you that it needs an AGM in it. Correct. So follow the. OE specification. Never mix the AGM with a flooded. For example, you have some emergency vehicles where they think they need or they do need more than one battery because oh, yeah. they have so many extra accessories on it. And so they put 
have a flooded battery for starting, and then they have an AGM, but they connect those both together. Just parallel That's a together. negative situation. Never positive. What happens then, as you know, we have a certain resistance factor in the AGM that's much lower, and current follows the path of least resistance. And that's Ohm's law, folks. Yes. So it's saying my AGM will get all of the charging and my flooded may not get near as much. And so can you usually upgrade to an AGM? Well, it, you need to make sure that your charging profile will accept that. Yeah, will the charging OE vehicle yes. take it? And normally cannot downgrade from an no. AGM to a flooded. That's very, very important. Because of price, you may want to do that. Oh, and we've seen but, a lot of people do it. Yes. But at the same time, longevity in life is not going to be the suffers. same. Upgrade for a high demand accessory load. Upgrade for long, for longer life. Key off power supplies, commercial trucks, APUs, auxiliary power units, and marine RV. Uh, Start-stop vehicles. That's a situation where we know that start-stop vehicles Check the OE specs, as we've talked about before. Look at the application guide footnotes. <laughs> we, have a, we have a story about that, don't we? Yes, sir, uh, we sure do. And changes by the year model, because we go to great depths to 59. make sure we're right. 59. Yep, me. Yes, so that footnote 59 is important to always remember or for someone to look at and read the rest of the story. So we've got to look at these footnotes to make sure that when we are replacing batteries that we are replacing the right battery with the right application. On Absolutely. Them. So looking at uh, EFBs in general as well with that footnote 59, if we are not putting the right battery in there, that thing is not going to last. All right. So we look at the cycling durability and cycling uh, characteristics of these EFBs. So keep in mind, EFB batteries are designed to work at a partial state of charge throughout the lifespan of them, just because of the additives. And that's not good for a regular oh, flooded no, battery no, no, because no. it doesn't want to work. It likes to work at 100% state of charge. Exactly. And so the EFB battery is different. It will work at a lower state of charge and still function. That's Correct. very important. Yes, we, we have some uh, stories that go behind a lot of this. Yes, absolutely. Unbelievable. So, when we look at the entire industry, you know, the way it's trending, I mean, we're looking at a lot more, and we know we, we hear a lot of uh, conversations out there. We hear a lot more around the EFB technology, and a couple of reasons behind that. A lot of the OEs coming from overseas, that's what they're using, is an enhanced flooded, because they can make this battery last uh, for a long period of time, and you don't have that added, uh, added expense of the AGM product. But it's still new in the United States. Yes, compared. sir, it is. But it's been around for quite a few years yes. overseas. You know, I guess we're adapting to the Europeans. I suppose. We must be. So, now let's talk about the builds. So, are we going back to the bandsaw? I think we are. Oh, let's good. Go. All right, guys. Well, there's no better way to take a look inside a battery. So, let's go ahead and get this bandsaw going. Jeff. So I know we just looked inside an AGM and I know we couldn't see any of the electrolyte fluid because it was soaked up into that material. Correct. Now we're going to take a look here inside the EFB battery and we've just drained the electrolyte fluid. Yes. But tell us what we're going to see in here. So what we're going to look for is the, the different positive and negative plates. We're going to see envelopes this time versus the AGM material. And we're also going to look at the difference in design as far as the plates. So let's pull this one out. Now keep in mind, this has been through a lot of cycles as well. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to look at, this is going to be the negative. So this one's actually sandwiched in between 
the envelope and you can see it's once again gray material and I look at the positive grid and this thing is basically just eaten up I can actually take this paste material and just smear it everywhere so this battery we know has been through a lot of cycles uh, for the characteristics that it's built for. And we still have a good grid design in here, but you know, as you can see, our paste material has really been eaten up. So Jeff, how did this battery end up in our lab? Is that something we were testing for quality control? Did it just come yes. off the road? How, how does quality. the battery end up here? So we were looking at quality side. So that's, you know, in order to be able to put our name on the product itself, We've got to make sure that it's going to meet what we're looking for as far as the standard. So the only way to do that is test it. I mean, you can get data from your suppliers all you want, but to be able to do it firsthand and see exactly how they perform, that's where it's all at. Yeah. And when we're cutting open a battery, what exactly are we looking for? We're looking for a probable cause, or if we're just wanting to kind of look at design, we can do that. So we look at design compared to uh, our competitors out there what advantage do we have over them mm -hmm. and so being able to look at the different uh way the plates are cut up and built and the envelopes themselves the straps um how tall they are you know as far as the plates all this stuff come into play to make a battery perform uh to where we actually put the interstate name on it so it's all about quality uh and performance and that's what we're looking for all right so we're going to look at the thickness here of the grids as you guys can see i mean it's hard to tell but these are really thick grids. We're going to probably say 0.035, if not just a little bit greater, which is, is pretty thick for an EFB design. They won't be this thick on a typical automotive cranking battery. So if I were to look at this one, a little thinner on the grid design itself. Uh, even though we've got a lot of paste material on here, it's hard to see. But this one is a little bit thinner than what this grid here is. So a little different design. Uh, these will actually perform a lot better in that uh, partial state of charge versus uh, length of time if we were trying to do just a regular flooded battery in an application. Okay, so let's talk about when we should use the enhanced flooded battery. Well, again, reiterating, follow the OE specifications. Region That's very, notes. very important. Can't stress it enough. Oh, yeah. And reference the Interstate Battery Application Guide footnotes. Read the rest of the story because sometimes there's a little footnote that may change the battery direction that you're going oh, in, yes. giving that customer the actual best battery for them. Because you know what? You guys are the battery experts out there. So make yourself the expert. Look back, uh, and I've got a little story I've got to tell, Gail, as we're in on this. So, talk about OE and replacement. Is it talking about price too? Well, yes, yes it is. Uh, so, got a call from a consumer that uh, was pushed through on the customer service side. And so, she had been through three MT35 batteries. Uh, so, she finally gets to the point, and this is three batteries within three months. Ooh. So, that's a lot of batteries. So, yeah. she finally goes back to this dealer, she says, hey, look, what is going on with this battery? I mean, I, I, this is the third one in three months. What is going on? Says, hey, well, it's got to be something with a battery manufacturer. So you need to contact Interstate. So guess what she does? She calls customer service. Calls you, Jeff. Oh yeah. So customer service sends her over to me and says, hey, you know, we got a customer that's really mad because she's been through three batteries in three months. Like, hmm, kind of sounds like a charging issue, but okay, let me talk to her. So when we get on the phone in a matter of probably three to five minutes, I realize that this is a start-stop vehicle that she's using. So once again, looking at the footnote, our dealer should have been able to find that. That comes OE with an EFB. Yes. Now, I will say that on our OE batteries uh, from the manufacturers, they even have on there, either in big bold letters, EFB, or they say enhanced flooded battery. Yes. So now here's, here's the caveat to all this. So I explained that she's going to have to have an EFB battery. She said, well, guess what? That's what the dealership told me. Yeah. Really? So the dealer told you in the beginning, the dealership that is, 
told you in the beginning that you need an EFB battery. But yeah, but me, I didn't want to pay three hundred. Yeah, bucks. let me guess. Yeah. It's a price issue then. She did not want to pay three hundred fifty dollars for a battery. But after three batteries, guess where she's had to go back? Back to the back to the dealership to the yes. three hundred fifty dollar battery. Yeah. So it really helps out when you guys are looking at the footnotes for these battery replacements. If it's showing strictly an AGM, that's what you got to put in there. If it shows it's an EFB, make sure you put the EFB back in there. We will have uh, coverage for about 90 plus percent of these EFB applications very shortly. That so goes back to the know. footnotes also to make sure you're following the guidelines that we put in there. Yes. Now this all comes, it's not just interstate. This comes from BCI, Battery Council International. So they are the guys that actually put all this information out there. We utilize that information to help you guys be the battery experts. Absolutely. So that's very important for you to pay attention to. And as you look at your application guide, the interstate application guide, look at those footnotes. They're outlined there. Make sure you understand for that specific vehicle what is necessary. For longevity and yeah because you're going to see other footnotes in there about uh batteries and and resets you've got to go back to the dealership or i mean unless you have the equipment to do it uh, but if you don't you definitely need to get it back to the dealership to get it uh, reprogrammed for sure hold it you're not jeff yeah i'm sorry i'm, I'm the one who asks all the stupid questions <laughs> Uh, we did have a few questions that we, we got from our audience members and wanted to start those off here and then we'll do a few more uh, with Jeff at his desk. But first of all, what vehicles come equipped with uh, EFB batteries? In a lot of cases, that start-stop vehicle comes with an EFB battery. It's going, again, follow the OE specs because they've, they've put it in there, put the right, the correct battery in to your vehicle and it may say EFB on the battery and or you can look it up in the application guide and look at all the footnotes again reiterating that to find out if your if your vehicle came with an EFB battery. Are, are they mostly European vehicles? Not necessarily today because years ago that was the truth but now it may be a Ford, Chevy, Chrysler. I have a Ford okay. truck yeah. and it, it has the start stop. Mm -hmm. When I stop at a red light or stop sign, engine shuts off, the alternator's not functioning, all of the accessories are still going on. So my gotcha. start stop would be a battery that I would need an EFB for when gotcha. I go to change it. Okay. And I know we've heard this question a lot. Are EFB and AGM interchangeable? I think we sort of covered that. But. We have covered that to some degree. Remember that there's a difference in charging regimen. For example, in that AGM, it doesn't like more than 14, 8, 15 volts. In an EFB battery, flooded battery, you have the capability of going higher on a, on a when you're recharging it in your shop or outside the, the vehicle. Yeah. Inside the vehicle, you might be close compatibility, but the charging that EFB has a different regimen than an AGM. So right. always be cautious or careful of by doing that. You always check the Always specs, yes, always and the specs. application okay. guide. And uh, lastly, can you upgrade from a traditional lead acid to an enhanced flooded battery? In most cases, it may not do you any good unless you've already got or it came with an EFB battery. If you're just trying to, oh, I'm adding a stereo system, I should use an EFB battery, that may or may not help you. Always make sure that you're getting the right battery. You a flooded, regular flooded battery, MT34 example, may be the best battery for that vehicle. And without going to the EFB, because we make our batteries to be very strong and to take a lot of have good reserve capacity and be able to have a certain amount of cycle life anyway. Okay. So you may not need to upgrade to a twice the price battery or whatever they may be. Whatever the price differentiation may be, you gotcha. might be good with what you have. But check with either ourselves, Interstate Batteries, check with your Interstate Battery application guide that every one of the dealers have 
and check all the way through with the footnotes yeah. to make sure that you're getting the right battery okay. for your vehicle. Yeah. And if you have other questions, you can email proclinics at ibsa.com and we can answer those. I'm going to throw one curveball at you here. We've talked about that. We've mentioned earlier the marine EFB. Now you're not going to have start stop and a marine application. So what's the beauty of the marine EFB? A marine battery is utilized at a lower than full state of charge a lot of times. One of the things that happens frequently is that fishermen go out into a lake somewhere, they go into the backwoods areas to try to find those special fishing yeah, spots. The so they're utilizing their uh, trolling motor, they're, dry, they're bringing the battery down Power to a lower tools. state of charge. Yeah all of this time before they're not using their big engine at that time to get those little spots and they really don't want to disturb all those fish that they're fixing to catch yeah, yeah. so in that situation they're bringing the battery down to a lower state of charge they need in a lot of cases an efb that so, has more cyclability and runs at a lower state of charge level so it, it's more of a power storage battery that yes. just goes down and down and down and yes back it'll go lower state of charge and still function and start in that situation. Okay, great. Well, again, thank you for joining us. If you have questions, proclinics at ibsa.com and join us for our next one. Thank you. Thanks, Gil.